and uh, I will do the formal YouTube intro in a second, and then we can uh, get going with the conversation with uh, Jesse and Sebastian. Cool? Cool? Everyone knows? Cool. All right. Hey, everyone. Anthony Fantano here, Internet's busiest music nerd. Thank you for coming through and watching this exclusive interview on YouTube with none other than Death from Above 1979. Jesse and Sebastian are here to talk about their new upcoming record is for lovers and uh anything else that comes up in this conversation too how are you guys doing good how are you very good. well good i'm glad to hear you guys are doing good so new lp on the way very soon it is not out yet at the time of this conversation um i guess my first question is what caused you guys to want to release this album during uh, you know the continuation of this pandemic essentially because you know a lot of artists have been kind of pushing their records back uh, as a result of all of this and obviously death from above fans are no strangers to having to wait a little bit for a record um but you know why rude not, I, rude I, I, hey listen <laughs> listen i i was happy with you know what you guys came back with for the most part so i mean you know it was, it was worth the wait um uh, but you know, what, what, what caused you guys to want to drop this, uh, uh, now during this time? Uh, well, we, if we go back, we started this record in 2019. Mm -hmm. So we, we made all the music in March, uh, February, March, 2019. And then I took that music and then wrote the songs on top of it for the, the next little while and then mixed it and then Jesse mastered it a year ago. And so it was ready to go a year ago. And, um, and we were advised to not put it out. <laughs> so, and, and that was the right move. You know, at the time I, it, it was uh, very frustrating for me because I just wanted people to hear it. I was so excited about it. Um, the good news is that even a year later, I'm still just as excited about it, if not more. And Jesse had a chance to uh, actually remaster it after sitting with it for, um, for this long. So, um, you know, we were able to get perspective on it in this time and still both of us are, I've listened to this record more than any of our other records for sure. Um, not only cause I worked on it more than any of the other records, but, uh, because I think it's, I don't know, for me, it's exciting. It's got life in it that, um, that, uh, for me is undeniable. It still does. Mm -hmm. So and Jesse, and why? Why not? I don't know. What are we going to do? Keep sure. sitting on it? Yeah, it, it, the, this record is also like the it's, it's sort of the record we wanted to make for the last two. Like we've just been fantasizing about making our own, like making records just ourselves because we knew how to do it. And like I've worked on lots of music for other people, but we'd never done it. We hadn't done it ourselves since the first one. And uh, we tried, we tried the last last time, but then the record label offered us an opportunity. Oh, you can, and we always wanted to record with Eric Valentine because he'd made the songs for the deaf. Uh, and we're like, that record sounds so amazing. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could record with that guy? And then to have these people say, you can record with that guy. Mm -hmm. uh, you mean you don't have like, to try to rip them off for you know, weeks? No, we don't have to weeks just try to do it, everything. Yeah. So, so we had done that and uh but still even as soon as that record was done we started talking again about how we're going to make the next one we're going to make it ourselves we're going to do it ourselves and this was also the first record we we did with universal we were on another yeah. label before and i think when universal took us on they like they knew what they were getting you know and they just they they left us totally alone and we didn't hear from them one time and they didn't hear anything. They never bugged us. They just, I don't even, I think they asked when it was going to show up so that they could plan around it. We had um, less, we had less people breathing on our necks. I mean, we had zero neck breath mm -hmm. this time, but we had less than we did on the first LP in 2004. Mm -hmm. Like even there, there was, you know, the label guy came to the studio, you know, be asked about the music no one yeah. did that this time totally he's like so are you gonna are you gonna add any guitars <laughs> <laughs> that question is long gone now yeah you know so that was like to 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 do that makes it uh it makes it very special if it sounds good it sounds good because of the work that we did there was no other hands on it i felt that that was two, that goes two ways i was like i want this record to either 
like really click and it to be all because of us or really or really fail at it because it's because of us you know like either or i'm happy with if no one likes i'll be like all right we'll take all the blame you know no one else mm -hmm. to blame uh, so i mean hmm. with, with this new record uh considering that you guys are kind of like long past coming back from that hiatus period and you're really establishing a pattern now with, you know, another record since coming back, like what challenges are you facing at this point in order to keep death from above and keep this band's sound and aesthetic refreshing and interesting as you simultaneously try to stick to the core elements of what made it so unique in the first place, the vocals, the bass, and you know, the drums. Mm -hmm. I think that um, what, what we're doing now, um, let me go back actually. When we first started playing again in 2011, 2012 and started writing and working on the physical world, we, um, we were treating the band as a separate thing. Like it was a third thing. It wasn't Jesse, it wasn't me, it was something else. And we, and we had to plug into it. And that's, mostly because it was a separate thing from us. It existed while we weren't playing together and it actually grew in popularity as we, as we were apart, you know, so it had a life of its own. So when we came back to do it, it's like we had to respect what it had become. I, I, when we started playing and I was fearful that people were expecting something different, you know, and then we went and did it and it was like, Oh no, this is actually what, what they want. Um, and, and we treated it like a third thing, um, for a while and we tried to break that a little bit on on outrages now but um we were fully the band and and us as individuals are fully integrated in this in this method the way we did it now we just got in a room together for five weeks with everything turned on and plugged in and just made music and we decided that whatever music we make when we're in that room together is death from above it doesn't have to be death from above you know it's like that's it's just what we are um so the lines between us as people and what the music and the project is is for me it's totally gone um uh, and i don't i don't want to have to compartmentalize creatively um and like oh this is a sebastian granger solo thing and this is whatever it's like whatever's good should go in the band you know because this is our this is our voice really like our our loudest voice no matter what we do um, creatively, other than this, will always be, you know, second fiddle to this to a certain extent. Obviously, if we make a mediocre techno record, we'll be judged against Mastercraft's tremendous techno, you know, but um, I don't think Death and Rose is going to make a techno record anytime soon. But really, whatever we do, and you'll hear when you hear the record, there's songs that are uh, incongruous, you know, to what Death Row Above is. Um, but definitely. I promise you that if we run out of ideas, we won't, we won't yeah. make you suffer listening <laughs> to us trying to, the sound of the dead horse being whipped will not be recorded by well, our band. You know, look, it, it sounds like, um, well, what, what Sebastian says is absolutely true just from uh, looking at it as an outsider, uh, someone who I, I swear to God, I don't just have this like sitting next to me casually like an asshole. My CD tower is like, um, you know, when, when I be? first got a hold of this thing because it got sent over to my college station and it's even got like the November voting sticker on it to remind you to vote on it. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, that came with the How original. Network? How yeah, network? It, didn't, it, didn't work, it didn't work out too fucking good. That didn't, uh, the vote did not get out. The vote did not get out that time, uh, that time around. Unfortunately, the, the vote, the vote did not get out quite as, quite as well as it should have. Um, but you know, uh, I, I loved and was blown away by this record when I had first heard it just as a bass player, you know, just as like a budding bass player that was just kind of just passionate for bass guitar and just kind of hearing it in different contexts at that time. And, uh, you know, and just for the, just a nut for the songwriting as well. But, um, on top of that, like once, you know, uh, death from above kind of disappeared in a way, 
um, it did become an, um, an animal of its own. And now it's sort of, you know, as you were kind of describing there, it's almost like the process of continuing and putting out new records is almost the process of reclaiming it, you know, and, and making it not just simply what it was of legend, but kind of reminding people this is a living, breathing thing that's going to change and do different things. And it's actually like a couple of guys mm-hmm. behind it, you know, that are just like evolving mm-hmm. this thing before your ears. Well, with that, um, and like what Sebastian is saying about, uh, you know, when we when we started, they're sort of always thinking about being respectful of this death from above character that existed. Um, the producers that we worked with really tried to keep us in line mm. on that. You know, like uh, does this sound does this sound like death from above? What you're doing. You know, is that the right, Sebastian, is the is that your death from above voice you're, like you're singing? Dave Sardi, stop singing like Ethel Merman. It's like, it's kind of more Rufus Wainwright, Dave, but. Uh. <laughs> like, but yeah, Ethel really, Merman. really, you know, even the, the, the people that we work with were thinking kind of along that same line. So maybe we needed to do this. Maybe that's, a, maybe the reason why we're excited about the record is just because of all this stuff that really only has to do with us. Mm. But I do think it's great. My <laughs> well that that goes back to the to my my philosophy with the band currently and maybe it always has been but it certainly is uh explicit in my mind is that it has to really mean something to me i was having this discussion today with someone we work with where we're you know we're we're making these pseudo videos now i'm just talking like insider baseball but we're making these pseudo videos for each song you know so when it goes up on youtube there's some video for everything and the label presented this, you know, just content, just some stuff. And I don't want to just put stuff out. It, everything has to mean something. It has to mean something, first of all, to me specifically as the, you know, the writer of the music or the, of the words and stuff. And, um, and if it doesn't mean something to me, it's not going to mean anything to anyone else, you know. And if it at least means something to me, then at least it has meaning in the mm-hmm. world, you know. Um, so, uh, and that in this record, like I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to speak about, uh, things that I'm, I have a grasp on and they're smaller things than, than, than I was trying to speak about on the last two records, but hopefully that'll, um, that'll resonate more. Uh, Well, to, to kind of get into that, because on the last record there was, you know, at least on a few major tracks, you know, a, a pretty sharp focus on, I guess, this concept of outrage culture and, you know, the idea of like the feeling of outrage kind of dominating um, the public square, you know, of conversation and cultural mm-hmm. discourse, um, you know, uh, to get into what you were just saying there, what kinds of themes or ideas, uh, you know, in an abstract or in a macro picture, are you kind of exploring on on this new record? Uh, I, mostly it's about my, my life and, uh, and the, um, the, the kind of core of it is, uh, is my relationships, you know, with my, with my, my family, um, and my family that has grown over the course of this. I had a kid this year and, and she was conceived and developed through, the conception and development of this record, you know, when people talk about uh, a record being their baby as a metaphor, it's like the metaphor is so close to the truth in this case that it's, the line is very blurred. Um, But a song like one plus one, the first single, like that's just about me and my, a boot. (laughs) I've really been in Canada for, (laughs) did you hear that? I moved back to Canada from LA. I was in LA for eight years and I'm, I'm all about it now. Um, you know, it's about, it's literally about, you know, having, being in a, in a long-term relationship than having a baby, you know, after 15 years of being with the same person, then all of a sudden making another person. Um, you know, I speak about my, uh, my aunt who's on the cover, my great aunt who's on the cover of the record. Um, there's a whole song that's dedicated to her. It's about her. Um, so the, 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 the themes are, are just like what I could perceive, you know, I wasn't trying to really figure too much out 
in a grand way on this record. I mean, we we've heard uh, you know, what you guys were doing sonically on one plus one. Um, this slightly different approach narratively, uh, has this also caused you guys to take a slightly different approach sonically as well, or do you feel like in a general sense you're still kind of you know, engaging in those uh, genres of punk and dance and, uh, you know, hard rock and metal? Well, when, whenever we were making a, the first record we made in a very small room. And I know I heard, I heard uh, a dude from Converge talking about how the way he plays is because he practices in a really small room. So like fast, things don't just become a, a wash as opposed to a drummer in like an arena rock band, you hit the snare and it goes for three seconds. So then you, you're, you're like playing to the sound, you know? Um, and we, we figured out a while ago that we were a small room band. Like that's just like what the sound that we're hmm. after. Um, and be, so the, like when Seb says we just got in a room and made the record, like we were really just, in one little room together there's no there's no like control room and live room or whatever it's just just the one little square and he put his drums up against one corner and then there's all keyboards on another wall and me on another wall and we're we're sitting a couple a couple feet apart and uh we wanted to just try to have uh just enough stuff sound wise on the record so that everything like the less sounds you have the louder you can make mm. everything you know when you have a ton of sounds and like that for that record you held up i had a lot to do with the mixing of that record and i had never mixed a record before and i didn't know that having layers and layers of room mics was like a was working against me as i was going and, I, and my way of doing of trying to fix that would just be turning up stuff like i'm pretty sure every my the eq on that on those mixes probably looked like similar to what i would have done with a stereo eq as a child just like what happens if i just slide every, everything up like uh, I, and i was fighting against it because i didn't know i had no idea you know one of those room mics would have been good there's probably seven and they're all different things like i didn't know any of that stuff um but like uh we've been our band for a long time, but when we started, there was always sort of a pressure to, well, you guys got to add more stuff. Like you can't, it can't just be what you do on the stage. You got to add more stuff. And so I didn't, we didn't shy away from adding more stuff, but this record is, it's like, it sounds like the room that we made it in, you know, and there's parts, the way I mixed it too, there's parts where, and I don't think we've ever really done this where, you know, even just the stereo field is like, Jesse's on one side and I'm on the other, not for a whole song, but like for sections where it's like, this is what the band is. And here is, here it is, you know, this is what it is. And you can hear it. Um, it it's, it's really yeah. funny to hear Jesse kind of bring up some of those phenomenons because just, uh, or, or, you know, rather those reactions and comments, because I mean, from my perspective as a music fan, um, while, you know, the sound between your group and these other groups that I'm thinking of is vastly different. But I mean, I remember that time, um, you know, stripped back, very raw and direct rock duos were the thing, whether you're talking about mm -hmm. the kills or white stripes or black keys mm -hmm. or Ravenettes or lightning bolts. I mean, it's sort of, it sort of seemed mm -hmm. like that was a time to kind of like break things down to the basic elements and just like give it to people as raw and direct as possible. Mm hmm. Oh, we tried to make that argument. <laughs> we've, we've been trying. We've been trying to make that argument for well, a long I mean, time. May, may, maybe uh, in terms of like some industry heads, maybe they weren't convinced. But I'd, I'd say artistically, people, uh, music fans, were certainly convinced. Yeah, I mean, we must have been because that's. I mean, that's all we did on the very first record. Like the the EP before that was just. It was really just that, and it worked out. But I don't know. I mean, I, you know what? I've never thought of that, about that before. Well, we were the, on the, at the same time. On this record, we we definitely, we kind of harken back to maybe your woman on a machine era, like funkiness in a sense. Um, and, uh, but we also tread, we definitely tread new territory. Um, 
there's some funny songs and there's a song called mean streets that um i don't even want to spoil it actually <laughs> but <laughs> you've already said it now yeah, yeah it's true it started well, we, okay well there's a piano ballad on the record okay okay and then that's that's what i thought there had to be some street. moment where it got a little soft <laughs> <laughs> it does get a little soft yeah it does get a little soft but you know what uh, it's, a good, it's got a little it's a good one but go ahead seb keep going oh i don't know I, it's hard to describe music it's like talking about i don't know that's his job Just talking about music is, probably, it's hard talking, to talk about music <laughs> talking about music is like dancing about football <laughs> it's a uh, the it's isn't it dancing am about, i right yeah sure. da- da- dancing, dancing about, i think the zappa quote was dancing about architecture or something oh. Isn't it Dan Zig about? Yeah, it's a Dan Zig about uh, yeah. uh, Rollins is is what I believe it is what I believe it was. Um, but honestly, it's like I don't know. I I, th- I think I think Frank Zappa sort of underestimated the power of writing about music in that moment because I mean, honestly, maybe um, a ballet about architecture is exactly what the ballet world needs right now. Like I, I feel like uh, well, I, I feel like he was kind of underselling that idea, and considering his connections to the classical world, I feel like he was the guy to do that. But it just didn't end up coming into fruition. I just learned earlier today that he he never really did take a dump on stage. That was just a myth. I've never even heard the that, story that he took a dump on stage. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's I guess it's sort of akin to the like Alice Cooper biting the head off a chicken or whatever. I mean, it's uh, like something that. Listen, if you want, if you yeah. want dumps on stage, there's Gigi Allen. Exactly. You don't like need to Gigi, put that all Gigi Allen's the guy who I know does dumps on stage. I mean, Frank Zappa is certainly an eccentric guy and a very talented individual. But like, whenever I, and you know, obviously, like, deserves all the credit in the world for standing against sort of like, you know, the censorship of music and you know, uh, free artistic creativity. But in a lot of respects, uh, like mm-hmm. culturally and. Um, you know, personally, he he struck me as like a very kind of straight laced, almost like conservative kind of mind, like a very introspective, very, uh, very calculated type of individual. You know what I mean? Obviously, somebody who is pretty I free think thinking, he, but uh, but like a very kind of calculated, measured kind of methodical guy. Yeah, he seems he seems pretty balanced. Also kind of straight edge, I think. Maybe. Right? But I mean, I, I, I guess my point is too methodical to just take a shit on stage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel the, like he uh, I feel like he musically molested his children though. You know, because like his <laughs> kids just keep playing his his music, you know, like just another concert of my dad's music. Yeah, yeah. It's like, what did he do to you? What did he do? You, to you know, I I as a teenager, I'll say as a teenager, I actually went to go see one of those Zappa play Zappa shows. And when when I was just getting into Zappa and like I, I had I had to take a step back for a moment because I I did not like the boomer vibes when I <laughs> when I went to the concert and I was like this is going to be cool. I went to see Van uh-huh. Morrison. I went to see Van Morrison a few years ago and I was super super excited. I was like, yeah. It's Are you fucking Van with the Morrison. lockdown tracks? Like, Those lockdown bangers he put he's out. Gonna be like, it's gonna be like sweet cherry wine, you know. And I went. It was at the Ace Theater theater in uh, in L A. And half the audience was just ipads just <laughs> filming the show i had to like <laughs> look around the ipads look around the ipads i left after like five songs it was a brutal a brutal ipad that situation was, that that sounds awful but yeah not that's uh, uh he came out with some of those lockdown songs last year and those are trash um that, that was him and, uh, him and eric clapton oh god is it yeah I, yeah that, eric, Cla- eric clapton's had some was? statements on that as well but uh, you know that's that's neither here nor there i guess um i wanted to uh to very old, very old. that's 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 the, that's the common that's the common thread that's the common thread um i wanted to ask you guys a few uh questions that people are throwing uh uh, thrown out here uh, in in chat. I guess I guess a really fun one to sort of challenge uh, what you guys were talking about earlier in terms of talking about music. Uh, for both of you, describe the album in four words before we you know last 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 uh, comment on the record before we move on to something else. Album in four words. <sighs> Come on, Seb, you write lyrics. You can, <laughs> think, of, you can think of four words. Stream is for lovers. Stream is for lovers. <laughs> Thank you. Are we a rap group now? Like immediately just <laughs> yeah. turn to promotion? Yeah. Or we should yeah. be wearing is for lovers.com. <laughs> All right. Um the Primus wants to know um what happened to the custom Rickenbackers that you had made, 
Jess. Are, are you are you still are you still rocking the Rickenbacker? I, I, I want to go get. I can go. I can go. Okay, grab you, one. you still got him. Uh, well, I mean, is uh, yeah. I, I, I was also curious about that myself. I mean, you know, as as a bass player, there's. Let, let me let me say a little two yeah, three yeah, yeah. things on this. All right, Jesse started. I mean, he was playing Rickenbackers not originally, but he was playing them mm. back in the day. And he'd always wanted to play them, but he started playing 24 fret basses and, and short scale basses and doing all these elaborate moves high up on the neck. And so he had Rickenbacker custom make him some mm. basses. And even before he Ooh. received them, he sold a bunch of his active, like Dan Armstrong basses, the ones that he'd been playing on records mm. and stuff. And then he That's got beauty. the Rickenbackers and they weren't quite the way he wanted them. So then he had to go and, kind of buy some new old bases yeah the the problem is i got i got so used to playing the dan armstrong and that neck is like real like i i learned that the dan armstrong necks are all just made by hand in the back of a shop in new york like ampeg gave dan armstrong some money to make guitars and bases he didn't have a factory or whatever he was luthier but you know they were so all all of them that i have are a little bit different even the headstocks are Mm -hmm. different shapes um but this is just it's like a little bit wider and this uh the fretboard is made out of some sort of countertop mm. material like like, like a linoleum do ebony. <laughs> kind of yeah yeah no like they i asked for ebony and they said oh they had this thing that i, I maybe someone in the chat knows what it's called but it's like it's something that's also used for countertops and it's really hard and has no pores in it. Granite? <laughs> no, yeah, it, but it's it's like, yeah, it's like fake granite. But I, I kind of like, I bend mm-hmm. the bass a lot. Like a lot of those notes moving around isn't the strings. It's me like pushing on the body or whatever. I can't do that at all with this thing. <laughs> that's your, I that's your, your it, Indian, it's your, the crazy. Indian in you. It's the quarter tone. You just want to like make want... it a quarter tone. <laughs> I have to start playing with my cuticle instead, like a serang. Yeah, no, it's uh, they're awesome, but I don't know if I needed to buy three of them. Well, I, I guess uh, <laughs> no? uh, my point was that it was a, maybe a premature uh, transition because I thought it was it right, was, man. I'm know, in, I'm in the shop. Like this wood is from '71. Like it's it's a bunch of dead stock stuff. It's, it's a beautiful base. Do you, do you know the the story of how this band started? Uh, any... I'm I'm not familiar with how it ties in with the base. So go on. Okay. So well, okay. I'd never I'd never played bass before. I wrote the first three mm. songs. Like I'd operated a bass, but I'd never tried to do anything with it. So we had another band that was supposed to play on September twelfth. 2001 in detroit with the blood brothers i miss the blood brothers so much <laughs> uh, jordan blyley is jordan the from record. the blood brothers is okay, on this amazing. record like uh, so crimes little, crimes is, is one of my people. favorite records of the 2000s i fucking love that record so much yeah, yeah. Crazy. it sings a scream, scream hook on a song called totally amazing Wipeout. yeah um so we had we had planned to go and drive to Detroit the next day and play that show. And so we'd brought all the gear from the basement up into the living room because we didn't want to just like leave it in the van overnight. And then September 11th, 2001 happens. No one's going anywhere. And so I had all the stuff there and and in very typical me fashion, I just have to go do something with my hands. I'm like, oh, there's a bass here. Oh, I'll just plug in all the things all the amps that are here, I'll figure it out. Oh, oh, maybe I'll tinker around, make some, make some songs with the bass because it was there and it was like not one of the things we were taking with us. And then I used that bass and that same setup, and I'm still using those same amps. Like nothing. <laughs> those are the amps that we used in a band I had called Black Cat Number no. Thirteen that was on Three One G, and like that was the bass amp and the keyboard amp from that band. And I just plugged it in with the chorus pedal. That's the sound of this band. That was it. Um, so why'd you, why'd record, you start playing the Rickenbacker? The first record is a Fender mm-hmm. Jazz. Then that pink record was... Oh, yeah, the Grabber. Because I thought I should buy my own bass because I didn't have one. So I bought this for... This is the sound of that mm-hmm. pink record. 
No. Uh, I bought this for three hundred and twenty-five dollars wow. somewhere, and well, you know, like I'm just old enough to have uh, been buying gear when people didn't want old gear. You know, and when e when eBay wasn't the same, when people weren't yeah. checking the prices in pawn shops. Yeah, I don't know when exactly sort of like the fetishiz price. the fetishization of old gear started happening to the point where you go on Fender and you buy the fake aged gear, and you buy the stuff that has the fake worn paint on it and the 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 fake nicks in it and stuff. Uh, I I have a Wayne I have a fake uh, a Wayne Kramer American flag strat that has all the dings in it like it looks like he <laughs> smashed it on stage I'm like yeah I'm part of musical history for only three hundred ninety nine dollars and ninety five cents. Um, so I used that for a while and then we started actually playing shows and big shows and other every every band that we were playing with had multiple guitars and basses and stuff and I just had yeah. that and I. And we'd be, we'd be playing in like an arena and I just had that. And I thought, well, I should probably buy another bass. Uh, so I have as, something as an up and coming else. rock band. That's yeah. like guitar envy. That's a, uh, that's a uh, uh, yeah. equipment envy. Well, I, and, like, I just thought if I ever break a string, I guess right. we just stop playing, you know, yeah, like yeah. we just have to just not. <laughs> and thank you very much. Um, and so I bought a Dan Armstrong and then I went to play it at a show. In the first second of the show, one of the tuning pegs just broke right off. So I took it back to the store the next day. And I'm like, this thing broke. And the guy's like, well, I have this uh, Rickenbacker. I can straight trade you for it. And that's that white Rickenbacker that I played all that time. I mean, I didn't have any money. So all the stuff that I had was like stuff I traded mm -hmm. for, you know, like the, the amps that are the sound of the band. I think some total for the two of them was like n not even 300 mm. bucks, you know, and it was just the sound of those things. Like I, th there's no, there wasn't any distortion pedals for me. I didn't have, we didn't have anything, but it was just working with whatever was there. Mm -hmm. But the Rickenbacker is cool. Cause uh, essentially the, the, just like the, where it sits, it feels more like a, it felt more like a guitar to me. And uh, I had I had the tech for some other band. I was like, hey, can you help me with the wiring of this thing? And all he did was just uh, take out everything. So it was just bridge pickup, volume knob, output, and like removed all the like Rickenbacker sound stuff. And I tried that. And I'm like, shit, this is it. We were also listening to a lot of yeah, to a lot of yes when we started this band. You should yeah. Listen. Well, yeah. Well, the yes, and yes. Sly Stone was like my favorite my favorite music in the seventh and eighth grade you mean drake's uncle <laughs> you know <laughs> he's a bass player in slice good yeah. friend yeah no, those are those are both good um just for riff or uh, riffspiration um oh chris Squires and let me uh, uh throw more two throw two more questions at you guys because i don't want to keep you for too long um there's a uh, uh, one person who was asking uh Seb, uh, what has been uh, one of the biggest surprises for you about um, entering into fatherhood uh, over the past uh, uh, year? Oh, uh, I mean, the whole thing is is surprising, mm -hmm. and and uh, what's incredible about it is that it's a miracle every time it happens for everyone that it happens to, and it doesn't stop being novel and incredible for people. And that's why we keep doing it. You know, that's why this project keeps going. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine. I'm going to name drop now because this is called the needle drop. I'm going to name drop. Um, Albert from The Strokes just had a kid last week and uh, won a Grammy. So that's a nice week. But um, we were texting and he said, uh, he said, you know, no one tells you how to have it. No one tells you about having a baby. Like you, it's no one tells you they don't you don't they don't teach you how to have a baby. And I relayed to him about uh, there was a, a moment earlier this year where my my kid was screaming all the time, just like these really loud, high pitched screams. And I I called my brother and I said, you know, did your kid scream? And what did you do to like curb it? Like what did you do? And he said, I don't remember if they screamed, and I don't remember what I did, but I probably did the right thing, and you probably will too. <laughs> like that's you know pretty much the best advice you can give somebody um 
but the bad stuff you forget. That's what's surprising to me. It's like, it could be really, really difficult. And the next day it's just because they're in the moment all the time, you just connect in the moment with them. So you're, you're kind of living this psychedelic life where, where time, time kind of blurs a little mm. bit. Um, and also this is philosophical, but it's like you're having a conversation with the future, which is, it's really trippy all the time. And you, I mean, I see the future when I'm not like in this, uh, Whitney Houston, uh, what's Diane, Diane Warwick kind of way, but like, um, <laughs> in a weird psychedelic way. I see the future with her all the time. It's very bizarre. See, when my kids would be screaming, I would film them a little bit. <laughs> and now that they're much older, like my one daughter's gonna be 14 and the little one uh, is nine now. I have a video of the little one, she was in the bath and she was really angry about something, but had nothing to do with the bath. But she just kept saying like the same thing, like, no, thank you. No, thank you. And mm. splashing the water. But for such a long time that I, I kind of like came around the corner and I, I have this video of her just smacking it. And I showed it to her recently and she was so embarrassed. And I said, you know, I'm going to keep this forever. And whenever whenever you need to be brought brought back to like, you know, a, a simpler time, you can watch you can watch this video that dad has. And I have Violet, my older one, I have her just screaming in my lap like red face you know that, that those screams where they they, they stop making sound yeah, it's, yeah. it's called the rec it's called recoil recoil and then it continues i'm jealous of my of my my kids <laughs> scream like i'm like man if i could do that oh boy if i could do that all right let me uh ask you guys one more uh question um you know just just uh uh for me um you know not to uh sort of rehash the hiatus or anything but uh what, what i'm more curious about is um from your perspective just kind of like watching death from above over that course of time kind of grow into that like almost like unforeseen legend status to what would you like attribute that sea change because obviously like the record came out at a time it had the reception that it had it you know got the reviews that it had and then it seemed like culturally whether it be through organic spread or maybe even through something happening on the internet that was just like this really weird mythos and almost like legend making of like what you guys did and what that record was during that time. And like, how exactly did that shift happen from your own perspective? Like what was the inception point? Like when did that momentum start growing and where was it coming from that kind of made that record and, you know, death from above kind of have the, uh, the reputation that it did at the point that kind of drove you guys to like, we got to kind of bring this back. I think that there's two, there's from my perspective, there's two important factors there and they're totally outside of our control. But one of them is, is that, um, is that bands, I, I've mentioned this in conversation with Jesse before, but like, the Beatles and Jimi Hendrix are always new to some kid, you know, some kid will always discover those bands on their own. They don't, they don't even need their, you know, their, their rocker uncle to introduce. They'll just like hear it. And you like walk down the street in 2021 and you can like see into just like the corner of someone's room and you see a Jimi Hendrix poster up on the wall, you know? So like Jimi Hendrix is always new to someone, which is incredible. Um, and that, that, is the same for us, you know, where there's a moment in time that someone can always discover that album and have that. It's always fresh to someone like having a kid. It's always new. It's always a miracle to someone. So there's that. And there's also, we disappeared during the ascent of social media. And so we missed out on that. Um, the culture of just being hyper connected to the fan base, which, you know, we do a little bit of that now, but um I think our, our legend was able to grow because we weren't as accessible as, as some other artists. You know, a lot of people, contemporary bands, um, bands that were contemporaries of ours, you know, they continued to grow and they built their thing. And our, our band grew, but in this kind of cult way, because there wasn't, people didn't have access to us. They didn't know what we were eating for breakfast or, or you know, whatever it was or how we felt about things. It was just like, it was a time capsule so it's more precious and also because it was scarce, you know, and there was the real potential that it would never happen again, which was, that's how we felt until 
like one email where we're like, maybe we should try this, doing this again. But it was like completely dead until one moment and then it was alive again. I think it was the logo. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I think, it's, I think it's the logo. Like, you know, my inspiration, not wrong. my inspiration when I made it was I'm thinking about all these bands that were huge to me. I'm thinking about the Ramones logo and the Misfit Skull mostly. You know, I'm mm -hmm. thinking about like the Dead Kennedys logo and just like, or even just label logos and how, you know, like the fun game of asking someone with a Ramones shirt to name two songs, like the the logo can also be this other thing. And I think that probably, prob I mean, look, the guy who signed us to Atlantic was like flippy. He it told us, he just like found our record and he's like, oh, what's this with this logo on it? Like, mm -hmm. what's this with the elephant thing? And like, that was what got him to listen to it. You know, and there's so there's so much stuff like there's there's so much stuff every day to 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 listen to and i guess yeah you know there was having this this weird this weird thing this weird logo like that that was my my goal i wanted to to be able to make something that we could have a flyer and our band name didn't need to be on it like you gabbo know. gabbo 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 yeah, that's yeah, yeah that's one of the funny things about music culture these days because i feel like logo culture is sort of like in the toilet for some reason and it's not even really just like with the dissipation of rock's relevancy in general because i remember back in the day a lot of the hip-hop artists that i listened to like public enemy had a logo you know and yeah, wu, wu tang exactly. clan you can look up at the logo. sky on, exactly. on a cloudy you know, day maybe, and see the maybe that was sort of like more of a pressure point during a time when as you were saying like a lot of the marketing back in the day had to do with like oh you have to have like a really catchy image to catch people's attention whereas nowadays it's like you know yeah. you need to have some kind of like viral tweet or something in order to get people's attention there's there's a record cover for most people yeah, is, is that big <laughs> so whatever the fuck the logo <laughs> is doesn't really matter um so uh so yeah you know it's uh, un unfortunately that's kind of like a a, a really sad uh, i guess a, a casualty of of, you know things going as digital and as like as you say as small as as they have but uh yeah i mean i miss a time when i was younger and having the logo to every artist that i liked that i enjoyed no matter what genre they were in being seared into my head yeah that's true even like the the font nas used on all the record mm -hmm. covers is oh it's and you just the second you said that i just instantly it came up like a like a clip art yeah, in my the, mind the wispy just, like and clear. everything yeah but just like that those, those bits of consistency i don't know it's helpful it's helpful i and I, the the strength of those old logos is to see how people are still like ripping those off i saw some someone's like new company uh, on instagram the other day i saw and it's just a complete rip off of the mob deep infamous hmm. logo it's like the one guy's still alive you can't i don't i think it might be too soon but you know like to see those old lo those logos getting recycled mm. now like uh that trend in the early 90s of doctoring it but KFC. It, was, it was also a lot of a lot of uh like a, a huge amount of energy in the band at that at that point like it was really was a great like a little moment that was very very potent and both of us at one point or another in that period uh believed without a shadow of a doubt that we were the best band in the world and so, and I think, I still think that that's an important component for any rock band. At some point, you have to believe that. Or like, why show up? Why would you show up? Like the MC5 already happened. We don't need to keep doing this, you know? But you have to believe that about yourself. And we did believe that about ourselves. And so it, it, what is it, you know, I think that reverberates it, at least uh, cosmically it, it should, you know? Well, thank you. Or not, <laughs> <laughs> fellas, back me up here. I, I concur. I concur. And look, I appreciate you guys uh, uh, coming on. I know me and everybody in chat right now, we're looking forward to the new record and we're going to listen to it as soon as it drops. And uh, thank you for uh, answering questions and being open books and uh, being chill ass guests. Sweet. Well, thank yeah. you for having us. Hope I you like it. Uh, yeah. Hope I, like I, it. I hope you, you don't, I, I, if I do, I will. But if I don't, 
I won't. I won't. You're going to know about it. <laughs> All right, guys. Listen, yeah. you have a good night. Okay. All right. Yep, you too. Bye. Thank you. See you. Nice to meet you.